Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, episode number 49, American Tracker Lane Benoit. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Lane Benoit, Master Tracker. You're listening to my favorite podcast on iTunes. I'm Lee Lukowski. And I'm Tiffany Lukowski, and you're listening to our favorite hunting podcast on iTunes. This is Matt Drury with Drury Outdoors, and you're listening to my favorite podcast on iTunes. This is Milo Hansen. This is Jay Fish, the owner of the world record Johnny King Buck, and you're listening to the world record podcast. The Big Buck Registry, Big Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to the show. This is Jay Scott. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. I have my good friend and field correspondent from Ohio on the other line as we speak, Dusty Phillips. What's happening, Dusty? Yo, yo, yo. I want to say a little something about a good friend of ours, a fellow by the name of Billy Daw. Billy Daw. Billy Daw. Billy D. Uh, Billy's been following us on the Big Buck Registry, and he had submitted a, a buck a while back. Um, the unique thing about Billy is that he does all his hunting from a wheelchair, um, and he's shooting deer. One of the best things about Billy is his energy, and he actually, with a little help from his friends, we got a page off the ground for him, Wheelchair Outdoors. I tell you what, Jay, what what an inspirational feller he is. Uh, Billy, man, we look up to you for what all you do, and uh, Wheelchair Outdoors will become huge. Yes. There is not a better marriage than Billy having a, a Facebook page to share his entire knowledge and his feelings with the world. And I'm following it every day, man. He's, he's, he's got more likes in a shorter amount of time than I've ever done uh, or had on the Big Buck Registry Facebook page. Absolutely. Same for Chubby Times Outdoors. You know, if you if you take a minute to talk with Billy and you you understand the inspiration that, that he has, being in a wheelchair and being and hunting and fishing and outdoors i'm telling you if you if you go like his page you're going to follow him and see what kind of activity he's got going on daily it's it's just like his personal blog of what it's like to be a hunter and a fisherman and an outdoorsman from a wheelchair yep yeah, yeah. true inspiration absolutely oh, true a- inspiration absolutely he is he it doesn't let it he lets it, it nothing stops him he keeps going and, and he's, he's trying to get it out there that so that everybody understands what life is like in a wheelchair and being being in the woods and outdoors and fishing and hunting and mm-hmm. that that's kind of why Billy's got a, a Facebook page called Wheelchair Outdoors. Look him up. Yep, and it's uh, it's actually Facebook dot com forward slash Wheelchair Outdoors. All all put together if you want to do it that way too. But there is no other Wheelchair Outdoors. So most likely, if you go in your search bar on Facebook, just type in Wheelchair Outdoors. You're going to find Billy and his. Page over there and man he's uh he's rocking it with some really good content he is rocking it and you know people's interacting with him and it's it's a way for him to talk with the world and and i think that uh he's gonna really enjoy it and it's gonna really get huge for him and uh you know you never know what the future brings for that yep uh, keep up the great work billy we're uh, we're 100 percent behind you yes sir all right so but uh, billy being a fan we have other fans as well and we have actually received quite a few reviews on iTunes lately. And I think we should run down on quite a few of them here. Yeah, let's uh, let's do that, Jay. And I'll, I'll jump in there. Okay. N- number three review is uh, Darren Short. And Darren posted as a review five stars, by the way. Thank you for that, Darren. And, uh, you know, we encourage everybody to get on and give us a review. If, if you listen to the show and, and you enjoy it, just hop on iTunes and give us a review and, and let, let us know good or bad. It doesn't matter. But uh, Darren Short writes, just started hunting last year and, and these guys have helped me with my buck fever. Jay and Dusty do an excellent job of getting their guests to reveal their hunting their hunts in great detail. The stories are filled with tips and lessons learned. Keep up the good work, guys. Can't wait to, to try these tips out next opening season. You know, Darren, appreciate it. And uh, we're glad that we're able to get some tips and techniques and tricks into your hunt world. And, and hopefully it takes your hunt to the next level. And that's, that's what the Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast is all about. Absolutely. 
This is from Adidas God. And I think I know who this is, but I'm, I didn't come across, so I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure. It says, great deer hunting show. The show is great if you're a hunter and especially if you have buck fever. I started listening to them when they interviewed Carrie Z from the wild world of Carrie Z, and she mentioned the interview on her show. Since then, I went back and listened to all their old podcasts and wait for the new one to come out every Saturday morning. I can honestly say they're in my top five podcasts. I listen to them every week. Their podcast is like crack and that I need my fix every week. But the high wore off by Monday or Tuesday, which leaves me wanting to to hear more through my withdrawal until the next Saturday again. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's really good. <laughs> that but is really cool. We're not uh, we're not insinuating that sh- you should go do crack, um, but that is light crack, and uh, I hope other people find it that way too. Yeah, and, and and you're going to get your fill every weekend. Your fix is coming Saturday morning, five a.m. every time, every Saturday. Yep. We're, we're we're on it for you guys. Yep. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna bump into a, a another review, and uh, man, it seems like as we go through reviews, Jay, five star reviews are popping up everywhere, and, yes. and that's what we're we're shooting for to make this the best podcast for hunting that's available on the net. Yes, yeah, I'm gonna bump down to number seventeen. Okay, it's by Doe Girls, and you know, Doe Girls is a scent free, scent control makeup, and uh, that that's uh, going to be a huge company up and comer. You know, shout out to Doe Girl, but they're uh, they're review went like this. Big Buck Racer is very informative. I have enjoyed podcast after podcast. Very educational, humorous, and supportive of fellow hunters, huntress, and businesses. Just when you thought you have heard everything, Jay and Dusty bring you another great podcast. You know, and that that right there tells you that uh, we're, we're headed in the right direction. We're, we're digging deeper. We're, we're getting the best information to our listeners as that's possibly available. And I uh, look forward to a whole lot more of that in the future. Yep. Um, just a couple other notables here. We got Tim Moore from Tim, Tim Moore outdoors number eight entertaining and informative without being stiff what more can you ask for say that's awesome so we're we're not all rigid we're not you know trying to read a script or anything we have our topics we want to cover but we like to keep it loose and real and human so I think that kind of spells it out. And uh, number nine from Carrie Z. Uh, this is my this is my top this is in my top five listen podcast. If you love deer and deer hunting, this podcast is a must. Very cool. Um, and I gotta I just gotta point out number nineteen, Dusty. <laughs> Dusty's mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if if you're going to do it, you got to have your family behind you doing it. You know, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Chuck Chuck is tuning in. You guys do a fantastic job. We tune in every week and enjoy every minute of it. Can't wait until the next one comes out. Great hunting info and something new every broadcast. Keep it up, guys, and you never know where it will take you. Thank uh, you, yeah. thank you, Chuck and Mom. Uh, Mom they, Phillips. They, they call me and, and tell us that we're doing awesome and that uh, everything's sounding good and they enjoy our show and, and that, that's what it's all about. You know, I, I appreciate my mom and dad. Shout out to them for being behind me for what I do and and uh, you know we we appreciate all the listeners for being behind us too and that it's an awesome thing and we're going to keep progressing and uh, getting more better hunting information out to our listeners. Yes, we are constantly in the pursuit of a better and higher in content and. Uh, uh, highlighting the hunters that make this this whole thing happen in the first place and finding those great stories to tell and uh, so yes the the listeners you the listeners you that are listening right now as as I say this to you with the earbuds in your in your ear or on your stereo in your car or stereo at home listening to the Big Buck Registry, we thank you very much for tuning in every Saturday. And uh, shoot us a review if you could. Go over to iTunes or to Stitcher and leave us some comments and let us know what you think about the show. Go give us a five-star if you could. If you don't want to, hey, that's cool. That's fine, too. We need to know so we can make this thing better. Um, Dusty, you ever heard of the, the famous hunting family out of Vermont named the Benoits? Absolutely. You have. Yeah. Who who hasn't really? Well, I you never know, but I, these guys are legendary. Right. There's a uh, quite a few brothers, a dad that was, you know, Larry. legendary. And, yep. You know, one one that sticks out in particular is Lane Benoit. Lane Benoit, absolutely. Lane comes from a, a very uh, strong hunting family, a legendary hunting family with a legendary hunting father named Larry. 
Um, Larry has since passed on, and uh, sorry to hear about that. Lost a lot, lot of good um, hunting influences in the industry over the last year or so. Um, but the brothers are carrying on the tradition, and one that is trying to branch out a little bit is Lane, Lane Benoit, and he's going to uh, join us on the show. Awesome. You know, I'm looking forward to this because uh, I think they're known for tracking. They are. Big, big trackers. If that's yeah, big time trackers. That's exactly how they hunt. They don't hunt in tree stands. They don't um, hunt in blinds. They, they're they trackers. That means they go out, they find a print that they like, a footprint, and they start following the deer. Yeah, so I'm going to try, I'm gonna try to get in some more detail on that because that, that sparks my interest. And I know there's a lot of other hunters out there that that's going to, that may be pretty useful. And let's, let's get a little deeper into that tracking. All right. Let's get Lane on the phone and break it down. Let's do it. Lane, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Well, it's an honor. It's, uh, it's not every day we get a legendary hunter on the show. Yeah, well, I'm up here. <laughs> this is the first time for me to do uh, something like this podcast. And, and I, me- I remember when, when I was approached, I said, that sounds like bait for trout fishing or something. Bait for trout fishing. <laughs> That's, we get that a lot. I, Dusty, we get, don't we get that a lot? Uh, we do, uh, actually. It's, it's uh-huh. crazy that you said that. Milo Hansen said something similar. He goes, what the hell's a podcast? <laughs> Well, I live up here in a kind of like a caveman up in, up in the woods here on a class four road with no power and everything's off the grid. Got a generator and some solar panels and pretty much left alone. Don't even have a landline. You don't fire his phone. So. <laughs> but, but you have a cell phone. That sounds like a I heaven. Have, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised it's working so well for us right now where the weather is here. Right. Now, tell us approximately where you're at right now, Lane, in the United oh. States of America. I am in central Vermont, and for most people, I guess, I know when back in the old days when we were racing snowmobiles and traveling all over the country, I used to tell them we're from Vermont, and i say, is that in, in New York State? Right. <laughs> and really, we're next to New York State, in between New York State and New Hampshire. Exactly. And when I'm traveling, people say, where are you from? I just tell everybody I'm from Boston. <laughs> and even where I live is nowhere close to Boston. But, so, where I'm up here, it's pretty woodsy, and uh, it's not huge woods or anything anymore like it used to be when I was a kid. It was a lot more farmland and uh, and a little more rural than it is now. Vermont's growing up just like a lot of the other states as far as traffic and people moving into it. So, yeah. it's a lot busier than it used to be. I mean, right now, where I'm living up here, up in the woods on a Class 4 road, there's no cars, no traffic, and it's quiet. All I'm hearing is the brook and the frogs out here right now. Hmm. I like that. That sounds pretty good. What do you say, Dusty? Yeah, it sounds uh, pretty awesome, really. Sounds relaxing. You know, it makes a man just want to put on some pajamas and sit outside and listen to the, the peepers. Yeah, that's the cool thing is, and, you know, nice thing about it in the summer here, the way the brook comes down through here and stuff, there's always a cool breeze, it's quiet, so you're here listening to the nightlife and... And if you you have to listen really, really hard to hear any traffic or anything going on, usually you a loud motorcycle or a big truck way, way off or something. But I'm kind of in a little hollow, so yeah. even though it's up, up in the elevation here. And it's just a remote, nice nice spot. It's quite a place as I could find here in central Vermont, I guess. Very cool. Are you, are, are you in like a cabin, a house? What do you stay in there? Oh, I have a log cabin here, and uh, I've got a big old trout pond that wraps around the ledge here. And a brook that runs down through the property. As I'm sitting here on the porch, I can... I'm looking off at the mountains up in the distance here, and it's pretty, it's pretty unique. That sounds really cool. Yeah, sounds spectacular. Elaine, you you grew up in Vermont, is that correct? Yes, I grew up, grew up in Vermont my whole life. Okay, uh, and that's one of the things I'm writing my book on is is what life was like back in. Uh, of course, as far as I can, my memory first starts is at, at the very end of the '50s. I was born in '54. Okay, so I'm writing from about 1959 on as when my mem- first memories are and what Vermont was truly like as a kid growing up and and being a Benoit, you know, and growing right. up under the shadow and you know the legend of my dad Larry Benoit. And and fallen in his foot tracks. Uh, Larry was a, a legendary man, um, and he is a legend forever in the hunting industry. Uh, he really paved the way for a lot of uh, hunting as we know it today, and uh, he certainly taught you guys a few things or two about hunting. Um, oh yeah, and that, you know that, that, that's typical of any family. And I have, you know, for fathers being a real father, they uh, they, they hand down their knowledge to their sons, and, and hopefully that they carry it on and you know follow in their footsteps. Yeah. Every dad's wish, I think, a little bit. What's your earliest memory of your of your dad? 
Uh, I think it goes all the way back into when I was just a very, very little boy. And uh, it was when they first ran pavement up through Route 100. Right? When we first moved into that old schoolhouse, it was a dirt road. And I remember Dad coming home from work after they'd been paving all day, and we got into a bunch of tire. Mm. And he wasn't very happy with us. <laughs> I was only probably about five years old at the time. But. That's crazy. Now, how many, how many brothers are there? There is, I've got uh, three brothers and five sisters. Three brothers and five sisters? Yep. It was a busy little family in this time. Wow. That's a big family. Yeah. And you got to realize back then, growing up in rural Vermont, uh, hunting was... Wasn't something that you did for just sheer pleasure or for trophies or anything like that. Right. And we kind of progressed into the into the trophy status part of it by uh, just for the fact that the bigger the deer we shot, the more meat you got. Right. And it wasn't about horns. I mean, we talk about the Hanson buck and and the King buck and all that. Nowadays, everything's about scoring and horns, pretty much. But in our day and time, it was about going out and shooting the biggest deer that you can find because you got more meat off of it. And as family went. It was a family tradition to uh, go out, and if you had five tags, you went out and got five deer that were, you know, legal deer for them tags. And, and, and even back in the days, it wasn't considered uh, proper too awful much to uh, share tags. Uh, the game ones pretty much didn't, didn't pursue it much. They would kind of look the other way because they knew that, especially the large families, that you're feeding your family, you know. And right. So I remember the game warden sitting right down and having a meal of venison right with us, and he'd look over, and one of them was a real loud, loud guy, a very good friend of the family, remember him looking at me and said, did you shoot that monk boy? And the guy would make it kind of quiver in my, my shoes but just by the <laughs> booming voice that he had. Yeah. I go, yes sir, I did. <laughs> oh, that's great. It was like, and uh, he ended up being a really great friend of the family. I said, never check out some of That's really great. <laughs> to scare somebody and to tell them the truth. Right. So you grew up in Vermont with your brothers and your sisters and a venison was more or less or shooting big deer became a way to put more food on the plate or store it throughout the winter and uh throughout the year it sounds like it was more of a sustenance thing yeah and like i like i said you know uh back in them days you know the game wardens if somebody needed food you know there was a lot of big families around back then and times were tough i remember seeing food commodities and powdered milk and cheese being handed out that was army surplus to some of the families that were needy and and I think my dad helped feed a lot of people around here off and on with, with some venison. <laughs> I really do. Right. And I remember as a very little little guy one time sitting at the table and it was in the middle of summer and we had some fresh meat on the table and I asked dad what kind of meat was this? And, and dad just looked at me with, a, with that grin he always had there it was kind of a sheepish looking grin and he said it's veal my boy veal. Veal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it, what it was truly, but I have my suspicions. But, right. And believe, believe me, the game wardens back then, if you're feeding your family and stuff, they didn't they didn't bother the family as much. Yep. Uh, you you developed a a pretty unique technique um, hunting where you do. Did you guys hunt in Vermont? exclusively for a while and then started yes, to expand? Uh, in the early years, we, it was all Vermont, and we were shooting great big bucks here in Vermont. We were kind of uh, the pioneers of, uh, of what you call uh, quality deer control management nowadays. Okay. We were managed in our own hunting countries way back then. Uh, we didn't shoot spike horns and the four-pointers and stuff. When we were little kids, when we were young boys or something, we were allowed to shoot shoot some smaller deer as we were learning to be a tough hunter. Okay. And after you shot a four pointer, you would expect to step up to the plate and shoot a six pointer the next year or something you know better. And that was kind of just what the philosophy was in the family. So eventually, we all turned into kind of like trophy hunters in a lot of ways. We would just you know would competition amongst yourselves and stuff. And uh, we were when we had hunting countries, we didn't take the four pointers and the spike horns anymore and stuff. And we all always had big bucks there every year. And up around Jay Peak, uh, Belvedere, and the big woods up north is where we were doing that, which was where my dad was from, was around Montgomery, Vermont, okay. which is up in the northern, northern tier. And that's where all the big, big deer were at the time, and that's in the state. And if you go to dad's house to this day, I can show you tons and tons of great big, you know, big deer racks and stuff that were shot in Vermont. Right. What happened was, then uh, Fish and Game decided they were going to fix the deer herd. They were going to make it bigger, better, something. They were going to fix it. And they fixed it already. They fixed it so they weren't hiring any deer. They opened up the whole state to doe hunting, 
and the hills just ran with blood from those being slaughtered off here for to the 60s and the early 70s to the point of where we didn't have had any deal left. Mm. And then that also with logging and some other things going on, the big woods turned smaller, smaller, smaller. In the early 70s, my oldest brother and dad and them decided to move into Maine. That finding big bucks here in Vermont was just getting ridiculous. And so as soon, as soon as they went into Maine, it was like like being kids in a candy shop. There were big butt tracks on almost every log road that you went and cruised around. And we were in heaven, of course. And, and by then, Shane and myself were becoming big buck hunters. And so we, we started shooting big bucks in Maine. And then we just started racking them up year after year after year. And, and we'd still come back to Vermont and shoot some good deer here off and on. I mean, I, yeah. I think the last buck I shot here in Vermont was in 2003 was an eight-pointer or something. So oh, here, and then if I get time to hunt Vermont, and then I, I can still shoot a big buck here. It just takes a little work to locate them, that's all. Gotcha. Let's talk about the progression of your skill set of learning how to track. When you guys well, were growing up in the in, in Vermont, did you start tracking then, or was it a different type of hunting? No, we, we've always been a family of trackers. Okay. Uh, that was what, what, as kids, when we grew up, you know, as we were growing up, Dad and his family, his uncles and cousins and all that, sometimes they'd be, the night before deer season, they'd be downstairs there and I'm getting ready to go off and hunt. This back when they were just hunting around balls. So sometimes they were staying at that house. And us kids were supposed to be the dad, of course. But we'd have our ear to the trap door there and listen to all the buck stories and the big deer hunters and the bragging and the braying. You know how deer camp is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we were li- listening to all that. And, and and tracking was all they mostly ever talked about in, in our family. That was how they were. And some of the, the older gents and the overweight ones or whatever would have to sit somewhere and do whatever. But there was no drives or anything like that. It was always about tracking or positioning yourself where, where the deer traveled. Okay. Gotcha. So the skill set that you, you developed in, in Vermont carried on to the bigger woods up in Maine. And mm-hmm. it, the... Correct me if I'm wrong. As I heard you say, the reason that you guys went to Maine to hunt was because the deer population in Vermont at that time was not quite where you wanted it to be. Yeah, well, the, you know, as far as finding big bucks and stuff, and what was also happening was uh, as hunters could get in the woods, the bigger woods more because you know, of log roads opening up some of the large tracts of land. When you got tracking a big buck around in the end, it would get shot on you a lot of times too. So, you know, people were within distance of where you're tracking. You need, you need big remote woods to track. When that happens, and right. that even still happens up in the state of Maine. Believe it or not, if you're up there tracking right now, you, you're live on and it can happen anywhere. Yep. I, I had a guy one time. I was on a big mountain range. I swear he was the only guy in ten miles around that mountain there, and that one one of the bucks I ever tracked. Right? So that was one of the pitfalls of, of tracking is you've got to have big woods and you want it remote and you want to be away from people if you can. And we key in on that. We, we try to find the most remote, try to get to kind of places there is and, and locate big bucks and track them. Gotcha. So the key is really to get into these huge pieces of woods where it's yeah. unlikely to find other hunters. Yeah. And if I track around home here where I live right now, if you run that deer around enough, he's going to get shot up. Right. If you don't get him, when you track him, and you don't get him in his bed, and you get him up and moving during the daytime there, because most of them are going nocturnal here. They, they'll find a place to lay down and, and hole up if they can, unless somebody steps on them. And, and, and track him, if you can catch him in his bed and get him in his bed, then you got him. But if I get him up and running here, nine times out of ten, somebody's going to be shooting at him, or they're going to get him. Right, because it essentially becomes a push, in a, in a sense, at that point. A human, yeah, right. yeah now there's so many hunters around central Vermont here that it's pretty unless you get up into the big mountains and you've got a pretty good chance at doing it up in there and not having too many problems the trouble is as you as the day goes on tracking a buck you keep jumping and eventually he's tired he's going to go down into the low west gotcha you're going you're to run him off the mountains and once he goes down into the where people where the hunters are he's going to get shot gotcha was it your father who decided to go to maine uh he had gone to maine on a couple trips with some friends and really liked what he saw and I think my oldest brother, Lanny, was a bigger push on that than anything because Lanny is a real wanderer and likes to see new country kind of guy. Yeah. And I, I'm the same way myself personally. I, I, can't, I can't hunt a particular place too awful long before I think i got to go and see something else. Yeah. And so I wouldn't say my oldest brother was a bigger motivator than anything for ours as doing it. We still always call him our chief scout because he was just that wanderer lust all the time. Gotcha. How did you end up deciding that this was the area where you're going to start? Was there any criteria that you laid down? 
Um, you're being fired as the state of Maine. Yeah, like what? What? Well, you you knew you're going to Maine, and you you knew it was rural. But how did you decide that this is the spot where we're gonna kind of rest oh, our camp? Oh, it's uh, after a while you you learn to see what's around you. Fire is the terrain, certain mountain basins uh, with got a good water source. Maybe at the base where there's a big pond, uh, where there where there's different vegetation from lower elevation to higher elevation. Um, great uh, bedding there areas. Uh, they got to have a good place to winter. There's a bunch of factors that you you've got to play into a, and look at. What, what, and we, just, what's... we just we just cruise the log roads too and look for big buck traps. Once you find one, and and uh, a lot of times we'll stop the rig right there and I'll track him with a snow or bare ground and see he's in my garden and see where he leads me. And a lot of times they'll lead you to where the pots of deer are. Gotcha. Tell me tell me real quick. What's is it a true fact that Big tracks is is nine out of ten times got a big nice rack on it. Uh, that's yeah, that's you've got to be careful with that. Uh, a big track does not always mean a big rack, and right. uh, I've been saying that same saying saying for a long time. Some of the best racks that I have on my wall have been deer with not all that big of feet. They had great strides and a lot of stagger in the track, which tells me it's an awful big deer and everything. And you sometimes those smaller tracks you you have to track them away and see what they give you for indicators on whether he's carrying a big set of horns or not. Right. So so you're saying that uh, I want to get a little bit deeper into that, Jay. I hate to butt in on you, but no, no, go for it, man. I, I want to know a little bit more about this tracking because it's not very often that you are able to talk with somebody that can track well. And uh, you know, with your your experience and your upbringing, that sounds like Lane, you got it going on as far as the tracking. Tell us some details on on knowing that it's a mature buck and, and with some decent size to it. You got into well, the, the stride and maybe some stagger. Tell us a little more information uh, about that, if you would. Now, the, the stagger is, is a distance. If you will draw a straight line from the track up front, straight back, and say you got a say you got a character square, and you run it on the outside of the, the track that's up front, run it back, and then and it turns into an L, like a character square, and you probably have eight inches of difference between the tracks prior side to side. Then, then the length of stride is the distance between the track between each each track. Right. Is there so is I, there is there any numbers on what like as far as inches, feet? Is there any details uh, that you can give? I've never be- never measured it, and I'm a, I'm not an overly long legged person or whatever. But if you take a big buck and he's walking at his natural gait, and I have to stretch out my stride to match it that's that's a one big long body big deer um, right. my logo on my hat for is uh big tracks and big weight with that stagger and and stride is i put a hot six shell in the track sideways and if i can put that hot six shell in the track and then don't touch on either side you're looking at a 230 to 80 pound deer depends on how fat he is and what time of season it is and all that right yeah it gives us that gives us a great reference uh 30 yeah. six shell yeah that's that's my what my logo looks like how i have just always measured them right yeah Awesome. Gotcha. And in fires tracking on rack wise, there, there's a lot of little indicators. Uh, a big buck, well, when he walks up to get between two trees, he moves his foot a little off to the side a little bit to clear the tree for his set of horns. And a lot of times they, they're, they will always pick the nicest places to go. Where if he's following a doe, she'll go between two trees that are really tight. He'll go around them. And, uh, if he does go through some tight stuff, you'll see where his horns are making a hole through the stuff a lot of times, breaking twigs off here or there. Sometimes they'll break a branch off and carry it for a certain distance in his horns. And then the branch will drop off, maybe, you know, 10 10 feet away, 15 feet away, that's how far you can be carried that, that one branch hmm. in the corner. Right. And just, there's a lot of stuff that it takes. It takes years to get to perfect and get really good at it. Right. How, how many years do you think it took for you to get to be... Hey. Uh, fire the horn thing. I, I believe it or not, in the last decade, that is where I really concentrated on seeing what's for big horns and stuff. You know, when we were hunting in Maine, we were just shooting big deer. And what if you saw a bone? You know, they had a decent rack. You shot it. You didn't. It wasn't really. We weren't really thinking about horns all that much. In the last decade and a half, I've been playing with the horn thing, and and I've I've learned to analyze rubs and tracking the bucks and figuring out what they got horns that way. Right. How many years do you think, uh, say somebody was just getting into tracking, how many years do you think that a person would put in to, to become a, an effective, accomplished well, tracker? That, yeah, that's a funny funny thing to answer is because everybody's ability, abilities are different. Right. Hmm. I mean, I have taken a fair amount of people out and tried to show them tracking and stuff. 
and some people just cannot see what they need to see. Then. Right. They so just, it's kind it's kind of like a, a gift then that you uh, yes. acquire acquired gift. It can be learned, but it is some people are going to take a lot longer to learn than others. And there's a, there's a lot of different variables. Uh, you've got to know when to slow down, when to go fast, and that's what we wrote all our books and all our stuff on. You know, through the years, it was trying to give some insight to people on what our technique was about. And here in the Northeast, it's Everybody's a tracker pretty much now compared to you know, the way that it used to be. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's still a lot of people up in trees and tree stands and hunting that style. But uh, fire as to be successful in the real big woods of Maine and New Hampshire and our, our northern woods of Vermont here, you need to be a tracker, you know, to really make it happen every year. Right. How, mu- how much does snow play a factor in tracking? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's the most important thing is getting snow. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't get the snow that we used to get in deer season, so it's been it's been a problem, you know, fires trapping and stuff. You know, I can bear ground them a long ways on leaves and stuff if it's raining like today. On wet leaves, uh, it's, it, it, you know, like beech and maple and all that, it's pretty pretty easy. And those woods, when you start getting into the soft woods and stuff, it's a little tough. But, and it's tedious and it's time consuming, and to catch up to a buck that's really roaming, it's not going to happen for you on the ground. Just like this. Right. Excellent. Gotcha. Lane, tell us a little bit about uh, the, the rivalry between brothers. I'm, I've never heard that there was a rivalry between any of you guys. I'm just assuming that there is. Having a brother of my own, th- 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 it was constant <laughs> fighting, no matter what. It could be over a piece of bubble gum. Do you guys uh, get we, along? We didn't, have a lot, we didn't have a lot of constant fighting or anything. They were kind of a silent rivalry more than anything. Uh, um, my biggest, big oldest brother and I were really close for a lot of years. And I, I noticed, you know, just between me and you there that, yeah, we did start having some friction when I started shooting bigger, nicer rack off than him. Talking some smack. I, mean, I like it. <laughs> I mean, I don't care what anybody else shoots myself personally. I don't, I'm not that way, but yeah. uh, some people, it bothers, you know, some people want to be the top dog, no matter what myself i don't personally i'm not out there for that's not why i hunt um and, but i do get a kick out of watching them turn green when i'm dragging one of those big racks i have to say that gotcha <laughs> So, hey, yeah, there's always, there's always brotherly rivalry. So, sure. uh, and myself personally, I, I try to keep, keep it at a minimum as much as I could, but it is what it is. Yep. When, when you guys are out, um, I mean, I get the question, sorry to interrupt you, I get yeah. the question all the time as well, who's the best deer in the area? Oh, yeah, because Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine wrote that we were the top three deer hunters possibly in America. Yeah. And that was my two brothers and myself. And But they didn't say who. Gotcha. <laughs> it, was a good, it was good in a lot of ways. And I always just told them, well, the public will decide it eventually, I guess. What uh, what year was that published? I remember reading uh, the article. Oh, I don't remember. It was 15 years I ago. After all that. I don't even think it was that long ago. Right. It was probably back in 2008, maybe. 2008, gotcha. Now, Seven, somewhere around then. What did you think about that article when it came out? I was just thinking that they needed something to write about. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> See, I mean, it doesn't sound like you guys are, I mean, you, you know your craft, but it doesn't sound like you brag or boast about it. It's no, not like- I, no I, we're just doing what we do. That's, you know, I never, myself personally, never could quite understand all the hoopla other than we're doing something that's a, that was a little unique from the rest of the world. And I guess anytime you're different, then it draws attention. So Very and true. My, and dad was that way. Dad didn't, he, he went right up until he was ready to pass away here. He just he always kept telling me, he says, I really, to this day, don't understand all this hoopla, all this about this. And, and he never really did understand. He never realized that he was probably one of the greatest influences in whitetail deer hunting that have come along and since guys like Fred Bear and all right. that. You know, he I don't think he understood his place where he truly was. Interesting. And I, I think the rest of us are that way too. I don't myself as I sit here on my porch and I just I don't know. I'm always I'm always amazed at it. Yeah, yeah. I, I never just yeah you know, meeting you guys before. I never felt like you were all caught up in it. It was just kind of like yeah, we'll tell you some stories and tell you how to do it better and we'll help you out. But you know, we're not really here to show off kind of thing. No, I, and that's not that's not in our genetic makeup, I don't think. Right. I'm, I'm more would rather be that mountain man that's recluse and be left alone yeah. in a lot of ways. <laughs> would you say you and guys are, are still some of the best deer hunters in America or you, you just don't even care? Oh, I, there's no, no doubt that. And there's other guys out there that are they're just as successful that you just don't hear about them, I don't think. Uh, I mean, hunting in itself has changed in so many different ways as far as 
is, you know, the way the world sees hunting. You know, I mean, out in the Midwest, they sit there in those skeeted huts, and why they wear camouflage, I don't know, because they're inside a hut, you can't see them. Good point. And, <laughs> and they're watching a green pile, or, or, you know, they know this buck's coming along that they've been feeding for five years, and, you know, he's a, he's a beauty, no doubt. Gotcha. <laughs> but pretty much ranch raises, I would call it. I mean, I would like to do a deer hunting challenge to the rest of the world if, if anybody wanted to disagree with that i've got some places where there's one deer in about 10 miles and see who can come out of there with a big buck i like the challenge how about the big buck registry challenge there we go and i've been and you know i've had i've been approached by by uh some of those real what do you call them there reality tv show the people that are once from la sure and i threw that concept at them but they didn't seem to bite oh yeah the the hollywood types yeah i would love to get the nothing against lee and tiffany or the rest of the world out there but i'd love to say all right guys come with me let's go to some of the furthest reaches of ontario or minnesota one of them places where there's very few deer and you've got to figure out how to get a big buck out of it right mm, that would be a challenge and a half i would that would be interesting. we'll have to discuss that off off air here see i don't know if it'd be fair to have me do it because that's what i do <laughs> no it wouldn't be because it's something you, you're, you're you do all the time yeah, i'm used to yeah. it i mean where i'm hunting in minnesota northern minnesota there was probably one deer in 10 miles in places and the first year we, dad and i showed up there we drove around for four days just to find deer track no kidding the wolves that eat everything out and also so it took us a while to find some deer when i did find some and they were dandies but hmm. when was the last I'm getting a pure, beautiful 170 class kind of kind of buck with a big, big mahogany rack and oh wow and that was that was the just about the only big buck that i saw when i was out there for two weeks interesting yeah. So, so I mean, even kind of, even kind skilled of hunters kind of like yourself. Hunting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of style of hunting that I do. It's not about having a lot of deer. I'm just looking for that one big one. That one. Not not about the a bunch, but just that one. Now, yeah. Once I find him, then I'm then I'm on him. Right. Lane, what? When was the last time you shot a deer that weighed less than 200 pounds? Uh, this last year. Last year. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I've lately. I've been hunting more for rat than I have um, body size. And I mean, this year, I may, I may hunt the northeast here, and if I'm hunting the northeast, then you're going to see me shoot some kind of 200 pound deer. Where right. I was hunting, 200 pound deer were not all that many. So. Gotcha. Other than where I was in Minnesota, that one, that one was just barely under 200. That my cameraman and I got together there on. But. Gotcha. Now, the as far as you mentioned that the the tracking or finding that big track is the key to your your success, but that you and I've seen this on videos. You used to have, and I don't know if you still have it today, Casper the White Suburban. Yeah, that was Lanny's. That was Lanny's. Yeah. And do, do you all kind of have these uh, heavy duty vehicles that you can get out in the old logging roads and drive around till you can cut the right track? Yeah, we uh, we all have uh, rigs pretty much built for going in the woods. That's that's okay. the secret in itself, right there. And getting back into places where the average guy don't want to take a thirty thousand dollar truck. I've got an old eighty nine Chevy Blazer that came from California. The body's rock solid, and, and mechanically we work working. I make sure everything's hundred percent for deer hunting. And by the time I get down this junk again, then I got to rebuild it for the next year. But right. So you spend as much time building engines to get out into the woods. Yeah, building building four wheel drives to make sure we got places like last year uh, I ended up hunting with a friend of mine, my cameraman guy, and we used his rig because that's what he wanted to do and, and he had a nice F J, you know, with all kinds of a barrel lock differential in it. Yeah. And that, that was a nice rig. We we got into it wherever we needed to go with that. And we may use that again this year. I don't know, that was kinda of in thought needle and now and nobody knew else who it was. What what's your vehicle of choice if you had to pick one? Is there is there a I like perfect I like one? my Chevys, my older Chevys. But. Gotcha, the big Chevy and you jack them up up so you can cover some yeah, larger terrain. Yeah, you look at 35 inch tires at least on them. Okay, three and a half, four inch lifts. So try to have a winch winch on them. So it sounds like they're fully rigged for the hit the woods. Yeah, you uh, you, you want a rig that you can get into some places. Okay, it's awesome. What uh, this is something that always fascinated me. It seemed like. You guys always are hanging deer um, at camp. Pictures of all and all your books. Um, I'm looking at a Benoit book uh, right now as we speak in my library. And the way you hang a buck, uh, we we've seen bucks hung from the back legs and from the racks. What's your preference? Yeah, I, I, 
our dad was one of the major causes on that was when there's a couple of reasons for it too is we don't when when we field dress a deer we don't open up the whole back pelvic area and cut out his anus and and split the pelvic bone and all that because you're just you're just exposing a pile of meat and a lot of times if you're hunting in a remote area we're not going to be cutting them up immediately so you don't want to expose all that plus also tracking it's not like we're just shooting them you know 100 yards in the woods and dragging them out uh sometimes we've got long drags and you gotta go through beaver bogs or whatever else you got you don't want all your meat exposed so when you do hang them up, you don't want all that blood being trapped down into the lower end where your steaks and all that stuff is. And, and old blood is, is what will contaminate and make your meat smell and not be tasty. Uh, if you hang them upside down, then when they drain down into the body cavity, they go right out, right out the, the, the throat channel, and the blood just drains out of his mouth, and you ain't got to worry about it. Gotcha. So you prefer That's to hang, hang from the hind yeah. legs. Yes, and that and that and and that and just always thought it was the most disrespectful thing to hang a deer by his neck. You know, gotcha. don't do that to criminals. The deer is not criminal. Yeah, I can think back to those old pictures and you know the thirties, um, yeah. where they all hung them by the antlers. And uh, yeah. I didn't know if it was a good thing or bad thing, but I see your point. Yeah, the way we dress our deer and stuff and, and clean them out and everything, it's better to have the blood going down towards the neck. Gotcha. Uh, what's it like hunting with a camera guy? I, my, <laughs> my, my per, I, I like to get out there by special. myself, and it's I can't imagine hunting with somebody else. you got to wait for them, that kind of stuff. What's that like? Well, I just want, one of the first rules is I tell them, it says, don't make me wait for them. <laughs> Good. So that's one of the first things we get cleared up right off. When, when it's time to get up in the morning and get going, I only want to mention it once if I got to tell them to get up, and I'd rather have them up and dressed and ready to go before me if I if they can. <laughs> and uh, then fires tracking and all that's going so far. I've been, the guy that's with me right now we're a good match. We uh, I don't have to wait for him or anything. He's, he's been physically up enough, good enough to keep up. And, yep. and I'm getting I'm pushing sixty years old, so it's not like you got to be some superhuman to stay up with me anymore. So was well, there how, how, <clears throat> how many camera guys have you went through? Well, Oh, I don't know. I had butted one once and it didn't go over good. <laughs> <laughs> We're still friends, though. We're Head still friends. the camera guy. Yeah, well, we got an argument because he was calling back home. And I didn't want him telling the whole world what we were doing. That's hilarious. Uh, not that there was anything wrong with what we were doing. It was just, I just, I, he was not supposed to be blabbing at all and showing footage to people before I get ready to get it out there. Right. <laughs> 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 head butted the camera guy that's, that's awesome. interesting I, I, used to, I used to be a feisty cuss you know i used to, I used to just trap her so yeah it's, that's hilarious that, that that'll usually get their attention you head butt the camera uh-huh. guy he, he I, will. I, i'm he much better with them now I, I, I don't get mad at them anymore when they don't get the footage here it's just i expect it them more than if they get the footage they go really you got it <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> now, how much do you have to be in shape to do the type of hunting you're talking about yeah, you. I, I start out in the fall. Uh, I try to do some bird hunting. Walking in the woods is the only thing that gets you ready for walking in the woods. So let's get that clear. You can stair climb and do anything you want, thinking that, or walk up and down a road and thinking you're getting yourself in shape. But the truly in shape, you should hike. You should be in the woods. And I try. I try to make sure I get as much time as I can to before deer season. You know, bird hunting with my dogs and, and being out in the woods as much as I can before I go do the real thing. Gotcha. It it always seems to me because I like to hoof it too that there's a different you're using different groups of muscles. Usually, I think you're using a lot more. Um, and, yeah. And if you're just doing a stair climber, they ain't gonna cut it because you're just using one set of muscles the same way every time. You get out in the woods. Yeah. Well, when you're walking around in the woods, there's all this stuff under your feet. You got a high step. You got to pick your legs way up to get over stuff. And you're you're just doing different movements and one repetitive movement. Right. You know? Gotcha. As far as like. The track itself, you talked about uh, just finding a big track. Is it easy to not, or say you found uh, some tracks, is it easy to get on another track that you think is decent but wouldn't be ideal? Or do you actually have to spot on, make sure that 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 30 out six cartridge goes in there, no problem, and that's the one you're going to follow? No, it's a fine one where the out six shell goes in sideways is a rare thing. It's hard. Up in the state of Maine, you'll find that more because they're bigger bones and bigger deer, especially in the northern zones of Maine. Yep. It takes a huge deer to live up there for the winters. Okay. Uh, from region to region, uh, that's not always the case. As far as when I was hunting down in southern New Hampshire, there was not a deer to be found down there that you could take an out six shell and put it in sideways. And Interesting. If you okay. found one that 
you could put three quarters of the shell in and you were doing pretty good. Mm. So you have to learn to read what the area has to offer as far as genetics and bone size. And it's like where I was hunting in Wisconsin this year, Grace, the buck that I shot weighed 185 pounds, had a nice big rat, and he had feet that looked like a doe feet here in Vermont. No <laughs> kidding. Nice, okay. Pristine, beautiful feet on him, you know, compared to, they weren't great big buck track feet like what you see in Maine or Northern Hampshire or something like that. It's okay. the same with Ontario. There's big track ones there, but I know, like, Hal Blood, when he first went out there, he struggled with it, what it was a big butt track. It's the same, he went over to the Adirondacks uh, this last fall, and he wrote a story there, and, and I can understand what he was pointing towards. He says, what is a big butt track in the Adirondacks? You know, he was over there for a week or whatever he was there for, and he was struggling trying to find a, a big butt track, because he's so used to seeing what may not. Mm. And the genetics and the size of the deer in New York State, their feet just don't run as big as the ones in Maine. And so he was struggling with that a little bit, I think. And that, after a while, you learn how to adjust and, and do that in different areas. Gotcha. So you really, that's a good point. So you need to know the area, the deer population that you're in. And then yeah, the- and, and what I do a lot of times as the bucks are being dragged, you know, brought to the way station and stuff, you see a big buck being weighed in there. Go look, see what his feet look like. See what size, what size feet he has. Okay. And that, that'll give you a clue a little bit right there. And granted, there's always going to be an exception to a rule. There's going to be a big, big track from somewhere that is going to be a big footed one. Just like men and, you know, and women versus there's big men and then there's small men, you know, and, and genetically that, you know, that's the case no matter where you are, but there's always going to be the size of a buck in certain areas and there's not just whether, the, the, you know, that's the, what the genetics lean towards or not. Gotcha. Okay. Very, very good point. Um, Lane, I'd like to have Dusty kind of run down through like a gear check, the type of gear that you bring into the woods with you when you're heading out. I usually have a GPS now, which I never used to hunt with, but, which is a hell of a hell of a tool because uh, it's amazing that it, you know, as far as I'll tell you, your approximate time that you can get out the back of your truck, uh, how far away from, from it you are, and it takes away from a lot of the guesswork that I used to have to do, you know, as far as just being a woodsman and, and knowing. Um, I always have a compass, sometimes too, let me have another one, you know, put it in my back pocket because the one thing about compasses, those those never lie, right? And uh, I know GPS can talk out on you at any given moment being electronic so you should know how to run a compass and I always make sure I have something to start a fire and uh, other than that my drag rope plenty of bullets and some food that are usually enough food so if I have to spend the night I got something I can chew on while I'm under a spook tree watching my fire go gotcha and if I do spend the night in the woods unfortunately I've never had to spend the night in the woods I've been awful close but never has it that's cool what about um, scents do you ever use any like buck scents or anything like that dough and dough and heat um, I got just one sense that I use. That's common sense. Common sense. That's good. That's, that's the best sense to use of all, right? Common sense. What about uh, game calls? You ever use any game calls? I, I use grunt calls a little bit okay. once in a while. Not, um, not a I lot. Can actually, I buy my own throat and, and burping. I've, I've used that as a grunt call when I didn't have a grunt call a few times and, and actually called the buck in. So, so I could hear him walking around and I got his attention with it. And he came right to me and came checking me out. Gotcha. Um, all right. So common sense of a grunt call of some sort. Use any like uh, dough calls or anything like that, like the can or anything like that. Yeah, I've got a little weed can that I've used often on that worked really well in Ontario. I've never had it work anywhere else for me, but out there there is a you know was at the time there was a high percentage of does and bucks competing. You know the buck competing over the does and stuff, and and the bucks seem to very curiously wise come come check it out. Hmm, interesting. That's worked pretty well on a couple times. What's your what's your preference for a firearm? I love my Remington pumps. It can be a 30 out 6, 270, it doesn't matter. Okay. As long as it's a pump of some sort, 30 out 6. Yeah, as long as it's a Remington pump. Okay. It's about the most fail safe, light, quick, quick action, ready to go, gun to gun, you know? Yep. Anything else that you bring in the woods besides that? No, that's pretty much all I've ever needed. You know, make sure you got gloves, and, and that's about it. I mean, yep. and don't overdress if you're going to be a tracker, because if you get sweated up, and then that's going to be the, one of the worst things that can happen to you. And all wringing wet with sweat, and then if, if you do have to spend the night when you settle down, you'll get cold quicker and heck from that. Uh, right. If I, I get tracking a buck really hard, I take my jacket off, take my shirt off, put it in the game pouch, and strip down real light, try not to get all sweated up. Gotcha. Uh, it, it, that does kind of break up a good question. So you're, you're not you're not jogging through the woods. You're methodically moving and sometimes moving faster, sometimes moving slower. 
Yeah, if that buck is really cruising and looking for does, you've got to go as fast as him or faster to catch up. Okay. And I and what I do a lot of times is is I slip up my gun on my shoulder and I'm headed. And my strides are matching his. And every time he takes a turn in the woods, if I can cut that track off from where I can last see it way out there versus where I'm standing, if he takes a loop to the right, and I'll cut it off every time. I'll keep cutting it off, cutting it off, cutting it off. And every time you do that, you're gaining ground on You come on to where he's making ground scrapes, done some rubs. That's nice to look at. There's times to analyze and look at things when I'm tracking. I can care less. I keep right on a cruising because he wasted a bunch of time there. I'm not going to. Gotcha. And wh- when and do you slow to catch when, up to him. when do you decide to slow down? When he starts slowing down and starts feeding or he's got into a, some other deer and he's playing around with some does and it starts to start paying attention. Okay. Very and interesting. And it depends on what they're doing. If he's chasing does and running, then you got to chase them and run right after them. Right. You want to try to get caught up to them, get in between them. If you can't you get between them, you've got it. A lot of times if I see some fresh buck urine on the ground there or whatever, I'll rub some on my legs. Or the same with a dope feed. I'll put some of that on, on my pant legs a little bit, you know, just in my boots and keep on going. Uh, I talked to biologists. They said the best scent that you could ever use probably in the woods is, 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 is their, their turds, believe it or not. Just really? deer poop. Yeah. All right. I never done it. I never ground them upon me, but I, I, like I said, if I see buck urine or, or doe urine, a lot of times I just stick my boot in it and rub it up, on, up and down my pant leg a little bit and just to give me something. But sure. I don't know if, I, if it works or it don't. I, usually by the time they smell me, and I'm like, I should be seeing them, and usually i got a bullet in them. <laughs> Excellent. What, <laughs> what about like yeah. uh, hemlocks or things like that? You ever grab a branch? Yeah, that would be good. Cedar, hemlocks, your natural surroundings. Okay. That, t- I, I don't know about all this stuff that they sell in the market. I mean, are you add an alien smell to his, his territory and where he comes into, especially if you're doing setups, I think it's going to put him on full alert, like, holy cow, there's something different here. Gotcha. Okay. Now, I, I don't, I, if I am doing a setup, I don't mess with their natural, what they're doing there. There's ground scrapes there being frequented and um, being used by the does, and the bucks are coming checking them. You don't need to go over there and squirt nothing there or hang anything up. And if that thing's active, they're going to be deer showing up. Okay. Just leave it. Is what you're saying? Yeah, just leave it alone. That's my. That's the best luck I've ever had. Gotcha. What What's your opinion on some of these scents and cover scents and and doe urine that they got on the market? Well, I think they got some stuff that's probably working pretty good. I mean, that standing standing doe or whatever by cold blue. I mean, that's natural. The problem is uh, what's going on now with the natural products and stuff. Canada's banned it. You know, like up in Ontario where we were hunting out there. You get, I think you get a $350 fine if they catch you with it now uh, because they're worried about chronic waste disease right. problem. But, so myself, I, I never use use any of this stuff hardly, so I don't really really have a huge take on it. I don't think I'm the guy that should be answering that question because I don't use this stuff. Though. Right, right, right. Yeah, just, uh, you know, it makes it nice to hear an opinion from somebody that's not using it, you know. Yeah, I don't. I don't really need to use it, like I said, because I just what, what's there that's natural and around me is good enough, as far as I'm concerned. I don't. I don't think tampering with anything is is the way to go. I mean, I've heard of guys that do set drags and and mock scrapes, and and, and it works for them. I mean, that's what they swear by. It. And, and, and the chances are that it, and that's probably just fine. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not really. I'm not somebody that uses it, so I wouldn't really be the one to question on it. Right. Uh, yeah, we, I, I, everybody's got that one buddy that that swears that the monster came down Central, you know. And I always tell everybody that my opinion is that it's a uh, deer deterrent on that scent rag that you're dumping out of that bottle. It, it, it's. Uh, <laughs> Seems like I it's just, more yeah, I just, not. yeah, that's the way it seemed for me. Was I, I, I've seen hot scrapes go right to cold because I played around with them. That's what, what do I have played with them? So that's why I don't do it. Right, and that, you know that that's a great that's a great uh, tip right there. Is that uh, come from experience? And I hate to say that because there's guys that are making a living off of this stuff, you know, and, and they swear by it, and they're doing good with it, and they're killing beer every year. So who's to say who's right and who's wrong? That's all you know, on that. So. Right, 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 right. I agree to that. And it could be just because we don't know what we're doing. Right. I mean, they, they, they I know they wear uh, special gloves, and they don't touch any human scent. I mean, they're real f- fanatics about how they go out. So. Right. It seems like that's a lot of work to go deer hunting now. Yeah, I, I just like putting a bullet in my gun and I stick my finger out, put a little, wet it, see which way the wind's blowing, and. <laughs> <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> right on that way um Lane, what do you have you ever had any encounters with uh, like wolves or any situations oh, like yeah. that i mean you, you can't help but have encounters when you're especially if you're up in canada or minnesota where we're hunting there uh, i haven't had any real rude ones with them but i have had a where they do give you an awful year refueling when you see one standing there looking at you for a minute yeah it uh seems like that might be a 
little hair raising experience there. I mean, as long as I got my hot six or two seventy in my hands and a full clip, they, they don't want to play with me anyways. I don't think. Right, gotcha. All right, so I was I was hunting in the woods um, a couple of years ago in uh, near my hometown and. I bumped into a hunter there who said he was good friends with your family, and I've forgotten his mm-hmm. name since now. But he was out there trying to get a, a deer for his son, and he had already shot his ten pointer because he found a place where they were crossing in this marshy area. He figured that was the one spot. He actually found the area when he was bass fishing and watched mm-hmm. uh, lots of deer cross. And he went back and said he shot a nice ten pointer there. But he had explained to me when we were talking there in the woods that. He had, he had known you guys, and it was a very dry year, and the, the leaves were loud as heck. And he explained to me that you guys didn't care about sound. Like, you just marched through the woods, and it didn't matter. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, I, we call that crunching up on them. What you do is basically, uh, have you ever heard a deer walking through the woods on leaves? Yeah. They just go, and they trudge along, right. and they stop, listen a little bit, and they, it's pretty much what we do. Okay. I mean, that's the pace I do. That's what's worked best for me. Okay. And if, uh, you know, you can, you don't want to go too fast and you just don't want to go too slow. And if you've got two people walking, I, I think they, they tend to hear that as like a deer walking with four legs versus man, you know, has a sound of walking with just two legs more. But. Gotcha. Gotcha. Once you get, once you finally get on a track, is it a solo game from there? Other than yeah, the camera guy, of course. And pretty much. I mean, I've, we've, I've double teamed with my best friend, Coker, uh, Lanny and I have shot a pile of bucks together. Um, I mean, I'm, we've done it where there's three guys. So, I mean, it's much easier as a solo hunter, you know, by yourself than anything. And, and just one-on-one, you and that deer, and there's nobody to uh, yell at for breaking branches or something to be quiet, make that final approach and do things right. And, and there's nothing like else in the world. That's one reason why we like this style more than anything, I think. Right. If, uh, if you learn to accomplish it and and, and excel at it, it is it's probably no more rewarding way to hunt than, than track a nice big buck down and get them. How long did, how, how long does it take from the time you find a track to? Well, on the average, I, I've always I've kept track of it. The, the magic time for me, and I've got some on film, and you'll hear me talk about it. Well, it's been about three and a half hours, and a lot of times it's about what time it takes me to catch up to them, about three and a half hours. Three but I'm getting hours. older, so now it might be four and a half. Four and a half hours now. Three and a half <laughs> hours when you were a younger man. Got it. <laughs> Right. Uh, but, but I'm just kidding. Uh, you were, each and every time you track a deer, it's, it's individual and it's different. Gotcha. Uh, now that you're getting... I've had, go ahead. I've had some very typical season to get them. The next one, I tracked him five minutes, and I don't track him enough of the rig. Okay. So there's a large variation, but on average, you're, you're thinking three yeah. three to four on hours. On average, though, I would say it was a good three and a half hours. Okay. Usually. Gotcha. All right. So uh, now you're going to be an older man, and you're, you're, it sounds like you're looking to pursue a few other things. Um Instead of just the hunt, I mean, you're still hunting, but there's some other things you're branching out into. Talk to me about um, some of this writing you're doing. Oh, I mean, the funny part about this writing thing is, is my my English teacher must be right now just can't imagine because I, <laughs> I was the worst kid in English class you ever saw. <laughs> I mean, he about he would have flunked me, I think, but he just wanted to get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> that's the bottom line and I don't know I get all these stories that you know that I tell people at the outdoor shows and stuff and, and they're always telling me Jesus Lane you should write a book I mean, if you can put this stuff down and write and, uh, it's reading material people would love it and so I'm taking my first poke at truly writing a column and, and writing a book now so I've got about four or five chapters of the book already pretty well done up and I did my first column for uh, Fred Howard's uh, the Outdoor Gazette, yep. and uh, that one was about a turkey hunt that I did where I ran into a mother bear and two cubs, which was quite an entertaining deal before I got done. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so far, I the, the responses I'm getting back, people really like my story because they felt like they were sitting there at the table and I was telling the story. So I think I'm, I think I'm on the right track on how I want to write and, yeah. and do things. Well. You're finding your, your writing voice. That's, yeah, that's the yeah, way. I, I don't know how good I'm going to do at this because uh, I never in my whole life ever thought I would enjoy be writing anything, you know? Right. Especially when I was a young fellow when, when uh, all I had to do, you know, they couldn't get me hard to write anything for English class, you know? Gotcha. <laughs> I gotcha. So you're writing for the Outdoor Gazette. 
Fred Allen. Yeah. Uh, who else are you writing for? Um, I, I, North Woods Sport and Journal wants me to do a how to do column, but I don't I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to do it or not. Okay. And I've had a lot of opportunities for different magazines through the years as to whether I wanted to pursue it or not. So I'm going to, I'm going to try Fred's here first and see how well it goes. And then, then I'll worry about sure. getting on board with some other ones. Probably. Gotcha. Uh, how about some new DVDs? I've, I've watched uh, a lot of the, the first ones that you did, um, and I, I've collected them all, and all of them have disappeared and never came back. So you know they're good. Um, yeah. I don't know. You know, I wish I had those copies back, but I know that I'll never get them back because they're that good. People just hold on to them. Well, I think they're selling the whole bunch of them. You can buy a whole, the whole lot of them off in chain now if you want and for a reasonable price so if you get them back that way. Yeah, um, that would work. He, handled the, he was handling all the DVD stuff and stuff with Blank Brothers. Yeah. And I'm kind of away from that now. So now I'm branching out doing my own DVDs. Uh, I haven't produced anything yet because I was pretty much tied up with Dad for the last four or five years. Sure. And I wanted these last four or five years to just enjoy our hunt. And I filmed when he'd let me film them and, and filmed what I could. Right. And now I'm back at it. This last season was the first season I really actually went out with a cameraman and with the intent that we were going to make some, you know, get some footage for DVD. And I got some classic Lane Benoit footage this year where I dump a big 10 pointer 15 yards away right in front of us. And, and it was just nice, awesome footage. And we got a nice eight pointer on film. So that, we got all that produced and put in music on it. And we and I've got a ton, a ton of stuff that I've filmed the last, I don't know, 10 years. 15 years. Very cool. And so I've I'm, I'm, got I to sit down and edit and go through years and years of tapes and chips and footage that's on cameras. And, and so I'm hoping to have one produced by the end of June. Very cool. So you got some old, the- old footage, non-HD stuff. Are you going to try to marry it in with some of the new technology sounds? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of it's not H- is not high definition, so it'll never be used TV unless they can figure out a way to make it HD. But, sure. Uh, but it's, uh, the stuff that I got right now, the one that I was showing at the outdoor shows this year, the footage that's from just last year's hunt. Everybody wanted to buy that. I mean, I, I could I could produce that and just sell that. But sure. I want to I want to give them a little more. So as soon as we get done turkey hunting and stuff here, we're gonna then we're gonna go back to the edit table and and we're gonna try to finish up and have a really nice nice DVD. Gotcha. But a lot a lot more to do in it probably too. Yeah, you've been doing deer hunting for years. Are you gonna branch out into the turkey hunting and stuff like that? Oh, I've been turkey hunting for since my kid was eight years old. And he's twenty two sure. now. And I've been I've been slamming big birds for year year after year here. Last year I shot two big toms with one shot in Vermont here. That's cool. You gonna film all that stuff too, or are you just gonna keep that's, that to yourself? That's film. No, that's film too. Film. Awesome. So you're gonna try to. <laughs> Yeah, this weekend uh, coming up, I got to go do a youth hunt down in New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. I'll be filming a young kid there. Hopefully, we get get him shooting a nice big bird on film. Nice. You never know with kids, though. You never know. <laughs> no, no, no. You never know. No. Sometimes they just don't even shoot. <laughs> True. Go, How do you shoot that bird? I've uh, I don't know. yeah, I've taken some uh, adults out and they forgot to shoot. Um, yeah, they just they get wrapped up in the moment. And yep. um, they don't fight anyone to take a shot sometimes. So what, what else is going to happen in, in Lane's world in the next 12 months? What else you got going on? Uh, I'm trying to think. What if, oh, I've got a new clothing line that I just had negotiations actually today. Really? And I'm not going to speak anymore about that until it's confirmed because I learned a lesson on that. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Every time you think you've got something wrapped up and finalized and right. you don't really have it signed on the dotted line, then it may not happen. So. Right. But it's going to be exciting. It's really a beautiful product. So. Some uh, outdoor gear, hunting gear kind of stuff? Yeah, it's going to be hunting gear. Uh, all hunting gear. So. Okay. Tell us a cool story your earliest childhood hunt that you can remember. Can you, can you throw that out there real quick, what, what it was and how it went down? One of my favorite ones was uh, back when talking about uh, one, you know, how long it took you to learn and do all that with tracking. I'd gone with my brother Lanny and stuff and shot some deer with him. And, and I'd shot one small buck with dad the year before. And finally, we were up in Maine and it didn't snow. And I decided, oh, uh, it snowed in Vermont. I'm gonna, we're going to go back to Vermont. And, uh, and my brother Shane said, well, I'll go back with you. And I remember my oldest brother Lanny saying, well, why the hell go back here? I should have to find a big buck here anymore. Should you stay here and finish the season out with us? I said, no, there's snow back in Vermont. I'm going back. And this is when I finally figured out how to truly put it all together and, and became my, became a big buck. And so we jumped in a 58 Ford, my brother Shane and I, and had, <laughs> headed way up to Island Pond from Duxbury here, which is a good hour and a half from here, probably. It was all like Route 2 and bad roads. And the roads were just covered with ice, snow, 
and we almost got wrecked about four times, but we got there. And it weren't until, until 9 o'clock in the morning when we finally got there, and we left before daybreak. And we bowed up into this, what was called South America Plon back in the days of the road, and it's still there. But now you can drive a Cadillac up in there. But when we went up in, it was like an old log road. Yeah. When I got done, I had the exhaust ripped off the car, and <laughs> I stomped and drove up through the floorboard and ripped the floorboard out from under my feet. So I was looking, I was looking down at the ground and going, oh, my God, i got to get this thing home. Well, we got up into where we wanted to go, Cracker Rick, and I got up into the woods there. Sure enough, there was this big buck track with a doe. And I ended up tracking the big buck and shot him and got him back home. We got back home with that rumbling wreck of the last time I ever ran the car. I mean, I ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> That's outstanding. <laughs> so, so we couldn't go in that rig the next day. We took my brother Shane's car the next day up in there, which was an old 60-something Chevy. A little better shape than my 58 Ford. Did you have to and, steal it? Did you have to steal it, or did he give it to you? <laughs> so we went, Shane and I went up in the next day, and we went and got another box, another nice, that one was a seven-pointer. And uh, and when Lanny and Shane came back from Maine, holy shit, there was two big pots hanging up on the porch, and it was the only ones that were shot that year. Oh, uh, wow, nice. That's awesome. Very That's cool. story. So after that, I learned, you know, I don't always have to listen to Big Brother. He doesn't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Uh, you, yeah, so what did you say? That's, that's one of my favorite stories. That's your favorite story. Is there any other favorite deer hunting story that uh, sticks out? Oh, I got piles of them, but I've got to save them for the book. Got to save them for the book. All right. <laughs> that's cool. I'll wait for that book. Um, uh, Lane, how can people reach you? Do you have a Facebook page or anything? I know you're yeah, sitting I, in the middle I, of the woods in Vermont, them. but how do we reach you if you if we want to talk to you? I'm on, I'm on Facebook and putting there every day, sometime during the day or whatever. I check on it, and uh, you can just punch in Lane Benoit and it'll show up. Yep. Uh, or if you just punch in uh, com, that that'll go to my website usually. Okay, gotcha. So, so you got Lane Is that right? I want to make sure I've yeah, got this. Yeah, down. yeah, just punch in www www.lanebenoit.com and that, that'll bring you to my website. Okay. And then Facebook. I'm going to be revamping that up, souping it up here pretty soon. So. All right. And I think we're going to do a little project with your Facebook page, if I'm not mistaken, at some point here. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Jay, don't don't get him upset. He's liable to throw the headbutt. Yes. <laughs> just be careful. <laughs> just stay away from his head and everything yeah, will be right, fine. Right. Put a helmet on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the new reformed wing. I'm, oh, I see. I'm not, I, I'm not the old cantankerous mountain man that I was. <laughs> the tank, cantankerous <laughs> mountain man that you once were. <laughs> <laughs> I should be, though, know, but I, I really work hard at not being. <laughs> well, that's good. Sometimes we all have to work hard at, at little I think, things. I think there was a bottle of Captain Morgan that was involved with that one, though. Uh, that'll so, do it. Sometimes that does <laughs> yeah, blur the, the judgment a bit, yes. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't have to drink anymore. I don't care about the stuff anymore. I've had enough. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Uh, Lane, thanks for joining us to, to, on this show, and, and I'm, I'm sure everybody listening will, will absolutely enjoy hearing some of the stuff that you've you've done and that you've, you're looking to do in the near future here. Uh, but it's been a pleasure. Oh, okay, good. Thank you very much. Well, that was one of the best big buck breakdowns we've ever had. Absolutely, you know, and uh, I feel like I could go to the woods now and be a better tracker. Yes, you know, since I started following the Benoits years and years ago, I've tried to do my own tracking, and I have had some success. I'm not shooting the size deer that they are, but I, I really um, credit a lot of my hunting that I do today in the fall when there's some snow around uh, to the Benoits. It's really, uh, I try to mimic their their whole game plan. And it doesn't always work out as it would for Lane or the rest of the brothers, but you know, I get I chew off a little bit of my own, and I, that's all I need. So thanks to uh, Lane for joining us on the show and giving us all his uh, tips and tricks and uh, sharing some good deer hunting stories with us. And certainly wish him the the best in his endeavors and writing and the books and DVDs and all the the stuff that it sounds like he's he's attempting to put out um, in the near future here and just carrying on that tradition of the Benoit family. Absolutely, you know, and that's a guy there that tracking is a way of life. Yeah, yep. And you don't find that very often. That's, you know, great content for everybody that's listeners to to go back and listen to again and and pick up some tips on tracking. Yep, and it's true. I, you know, you put a big buck in a five-mile radius or whatever, my money's on lane. Oh, yeah, you know? sure. It's, uh, it's a skill set that you don't, well, you need snow first and foremost during hunting season. So there are only so many places in the country where you can make that happen. You know, it's not, not common once you get south of like Pennsylvania, really, you know, and I don't, I don't really see a lot of snow in Pennsylvania in November, maybe in December, but 
It's uh, It would be something you could do later. And you need mountains and big open spaces with no other hunters. Right on, for sure. You've got to have wide open land for that. Yep. And they do hunt all public land. It's not private. I know that for sure, which is interesting. So you got to find large acres or large tracts of public land where nobody else goes where a big deer like to hang out. That's hard to find. Absolutely. You know, no population and... That's, uh, I mean, it's out there. Don't get me wrong. It's definitely out there. It's but, out there. But it maybe some places in Kentucky, you think you could do that? Yeah, possibility. Uh, you know, even Tennessee, maybe. Uh, you, you get more out west, I'm sure there's plenty of acreage that's, you know, unpopulated. Right. And you need snow. So maybe Kentucky isn't a place where you could really do that. That's more of a, I always think of Kentucky as a, as a southern state and a warmer climate during the fall season anyway. That'd be hard to do. Right, for sure. Yeah, I, I agree to that 100%. Yeah. So, yeah. Just, uh, you know, it'd take a special area to do a show like that, right. put something together like that. It's almost like you have to go to Michigan, Minnesota, northern Michigan, northern Minnesota, go to New Hampshire, north, you know, Maine. There are only certain areas. It's like a perfect blend, kind of like we were talking about um, Billy Daw and his, his uh, Facebook page. That's a perfect match. This is kind of a per- perfect match, this skill set, this family, Lane, hunting these types of, of tracks that are near his home. Yeah, right on. Yep. Um, very good show. Thanks uh, thanks for joining me, Dusty, and thanks to you listening to the show, and uh, we'll come back and do it again. Absolutely. Yep. In the meantime, how can we reach out to you, Dusty? Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. Rock and roll. How about you, Jay, at the Big Buck Registry? BigBuckRegistry.com. Facebook is BigBuckRegistry.com forward slash Facebook, and Twitter is BigBuckRegistry.com forward slash Twitter. Phone number is 724-613-2825. You can call in a, a review if you want to do an audio review instead of an iTunes review. Um, leave us a, a message there. Tell, ask a question if you have a hunting question that we can post on our Facebook platform and get some answers for you. Uh, that's that's always worked out really well. Uh, you can always text a picture in of a big buck, and if you want to share a big buck on Facebook, that's very cool too. Um, send me an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com. I think that's it just you know hang out on stitch or hang out on itunes and listen to the show and give us a review when you're done that's uh that would be great absolutely we really thank you for the folks that give us a review and uh, thanks to the future reviews that would be coming in yes keep them coming um this is jay scott and i'm dusty Phillips. this is the big buck registry's big buck podcast see you next week can't wait yeah.